A mixed day in the greens on Wednesday. Ted Cypher Zaner Ag Hedge is joining us. And corn and soybeans moving in opposite directions on Wednesday. We didn't have a whole lot of news. So was it technical or what was going on? Yeah, really, Michelle, there's a lot of technical things that were happening uh, throughout the day on Wednesday. Uh, for one, if we look at soybeans, you know, we got down to the 10-day moving average, and it's sort of right on top of the string of lows that we've had from the past 10 trade sessions or so. And then we were able to bounce off that one more time, right? And uh, and then we got up to our, 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 our other shorter-term moving average, 20-day moving average, up above us and failed, right? So we're ping-ponging between moving averages right now on the soybeans uh, and basically treading water. You know, after the, the bigger down day that we had on Monday, we had some strength on Tuesday, but gave back most of those gains by the end of the day, had some strength on Wednesday, gave back a lot of those gains by the end of the day, still haven't completely taken back all of the weakness that we saw on Monday. So really just treading water, kind of going sideways, waiting for some sort of news, the next shoe to drop, some South American weather updates, uh, some export, you know, some, something to give us a little bit more to talk about and more to trade on. Um, for wheat, you know, we had gotten really oversold. We were due for a little bit of a minor bounce, and I think that's what you saw. Yeah. And in the meantime, corn pushing lower. I think that has to do with, uh, I, I still think we're seeing harvest pressure, Michelle. You, you've got a, a, a number, really a lot of guys, most of the guys that I'm talking to saying, hey, my corn crop was quite a bit better than I was expecting. I've got extra bushels that I was not accounting for. So those bushels are, are going to town and they're they're getting sold. They haven't been previously sold. Um, so that's that's sort of happening as well. And you had corn kind of break out to new recent lows. In fact, this is the lowest close that we've seen since September 18th in the corn. Now, one interesting thing that we've got going on would could be a inverted or a big, uh, big, broad bottoming head and shoulders formation in the corn. Uh, this being the second shoulder, it's a possible thing. But, you know, it didn't leave you with good, warm and fuzzy feelings at the end of the day because uh, we didn't reverse higher. You know, it wasn't a big reversal higher. We did close a little bit off the lows, but still down three and three quarters on the day. Uh, so, you know, in the next couple of days, whether we hold today's low or not, uh, that's going to be a big question mark. If you break through today's low, unfortunately, you can take that bottoming formation sort of off the chart. And this whole hope that a lot of analysts have for the seasonal March higher into the end of the calendar year, um, it, this might be one of those years where seasonality doesn't work. And I think there's a couple of reasons why that might be. Well, let's talk about that. Um, you know, we do have some headwinds, obviously. One of those is a pretty big South American weather or crop coming at us and not any big weather story, right? Yeah, you know, we've been talking about dryness in Argentina, which for one, they got some rains and that's going to allow them to get a little bit more aggressive on planting. They don't subscribe to the saying of, you know, plant and dust and your bins will bust. They want to have good moisture before they plant. And the rains they got last weekend um, or in the last 10 days or so, is going to allow for that to happen. So that that's easing a little bit. The dryness in Argentina is more of a wheat problem than anything else. Um, and then Brazil, yeah, you know, you can talk about maybe uh, a little bit less, well, in some areas, a little bit less rainfall than they normally would have in the season. But this is a very rainy season. They, they're getting enough rainfall to say, hey, you, they can still have absolute bumper crops. There are some areas that are too wet. You know, the very southern portion of Brazil, uh, Paraná and Paraguay as well. Um but, you know, it's a long growing season. If that dries out, they're going to be happy for that subsoil moisture. Again, I, I don't think that's a reason to get terribly excited as of yet. Um, we're also kind of lacking for any any major export news. Uh, our exports are chugging along. Not any better than expected. They're better than they have been, but there's really nothing to write home about there yet. Uh, you know, we got that big signing with the Chinese delegation, but we didn't really see any flash sales to follow up on that aside from a couple small ones. Um you know, so really, we're just waiting for something to happen. But if we don't get a positive spark here sometime relatively soon, again, I think seasonality could start to fall apart. You have a whole lot of uh, macroeconomic things going on, you know, global unrest uh, in multiple parts of the world um, and more that could be triggered in the short run. So that's kind of weighing on, on things, you know, domestic stock market, global equities, um, global economy is in question. Uh, you also have a very strong U.S. dollar. You know, this time to have that this time of year uh, is a bit of a headwinds for commodities, obviously. Um, and then, you know, the fact of the matter is, Michelle, we're at some fairly elevated prices. I know we're well off the of highs that we had for the last couple of years, but still for this time on the calendar, we're higher than we would normally be trading um, at harvest time. Right. So 
you know, if we're at 330 to 360, 380 corn or so, you would expect, yeah, okay, now is the time where we can start to recover now that the harvest pressure is maybe behind us. But one, I'm not sure harvest pressure is necessarily behind us, and we're trading about a dollar higher than that. So do we need to go higher into the end of the calendar year? Uh, again, a lot of analysts want to yeah. say, yes, absolutely, because that's what we do every year, or not every year, but seasonally, that's what we like to do. But that's the thing about seasonality, Michelle. It doesn't always work. You know, there are these outlier years, and I wonder if this might be one of them. Yeah, and you mentioned a new low close for corn, but soybeans were effectively still within our trading ranges, aren't we? Yeah, soybeans have been a really tight range here, like five last five or six trading sessions. Uh, at one point here, we're going to break out one way or the other. I got to say, with the fact that we tried to rally Tuesday and again on Wednesday, and we weren't able to close up near the highs, we gave back a, a good portion of the gains. It makes you feel like the next po- the next push might be to the downside. Uh, you got to watch those lows for Monday very closely because if you get down below those lows, you're going to break a string of lows. Uh, and then you've got some some pretty uh, thin air until we get back to you know where we were when the, the last WASDI report came out. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, the wheat market, obviously a little short covering bounce today because we were oversold, but we're down at, you know, close to contract lows in all three classes. How much farther do the funds push this thing, especially considering, you know, you got two wars going on in the in the globe? Yeah. Yeah, Michelle, I, it's a great question. You know, I, I, we, we keep looking to try to find a bottom in wheat. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, Something that would really help wheat would would be is if the row crops could put it in the seasonal low and start to bounce. Yeah, I think that would allow wheat to say, "Hey, me too," you know. And and your your speculators, your funds, you, they would potentially stop selling it. But I, I don't know. You know, every time we start to say, "Hey, you know, it looks like we got a little bit of a bottom from bottoming formation happening on the wheat chart," this is giving us op- uh, optimism. It's you know, hey, this this could be good. Well, then we turn around and make new lows, and that seems to happen. You know, every time we sort of expect we to, to be putting in a low. So I, the, the answer to that question is I'm not sure. You know, you would think that they can't really grow their position too much further than where they are right now. And you would also think that there's really not a whole lot of incentive for them to do that. Uh, but I'm not so sure there's a whole lot of incentive for them to come in and, and really own it at any time soon. Yeah. They can continue to make money on the roll, right? Because it's just the way that the carry is structured into the market if they just continue to roll from one contract to the next and that next contract comes down and expires uh, close to where the previous contract expired, they have no reason to get out of their short position. So I don't know. We're going to need some sort of spark here, Michelle. You would think we've had many of them, but really they haven't really panned out or come to fruition. Uh, And like I said, maybe it would help if the row crops could put in a bottom and start to go higher. But as we just talked about, I'm not sure that's really going to be the case in the short run either. Yeah. Largely disappointing. So let's talk about the cattle market. We have consolidated now off the October lows, but we're up into some major chart resistance now, especially in the December. Do you think we can get past that point? It's a really good question, Michelle. Uh, I, I still have some some bullish feelings on cattle from a fundamental standpoint. I know the cattle on feed report that we saw two weeks ago was surprisingly, shockingly bearish, and the market reacted to that. In fact, we gapped lower, right? So, but now we've gotten ourselves back in back into the gap haven't fully closed it, which is a concern. Nope. The bigger concern that I have, though, Michelle, is that, you know, there's a, an old adage is the feeders are the leaders. Well, feeders have not led this bounce in cattle. This has been a, a technical retracement happening in the live cattle market. Feeder cattle have not responded to that, uh, really just kind of treading water at the lows, slightly higher, but but really not having that bigger reaction. And unfortunately, I, unless we get a bigger update in the feeder cattle, I start to feel more and more like this is just a corrective move in the cattle and that we're maybe not done with this correction to the downside. Not saying that we necessarily need to get below the lows that we had from four or five trade sessions ago. But, you know, maybe we just spend more time carving out of a bottom, uh, maybe sideways trade or, or probably minimally go back and test those lows. Now, whether we make new ones or not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Like I said, fundamentally, at least in the shorter term, I'm still fairly friendly for cattle. Domestic demand seems to be really rather good. We bounced back on exports from two weeks ago when we had, we had virtually zero number. Uh, but yeah, you know, again, uh, I don't like the fact that feeders aren't following or leading the way, really. Yeah, and hogs... Kind of the same question there. You know, we had a nice retracement off of the contract lows. Uh, We're down today. Was that profit taking? Because we had hit 50% retracement levels. So we'd also gotten up into resistance there too, hadn't we? 
Yeah, that's right, Michelle. 50% retracement level, but also this downward trending channel that we've been in, we went up to the top end of that and sort of failed. You know, that you're going to see some profit taking there, especially when you have like a V bottom low in, in hogs like they do right now. Um, now the question is how much profit taking incurs, how much chart damage might it do? I, I don't think just from today we've done really anything uh, to the chart that says, oh, okay, wow, we're going to go back and make new lows again. Uh, fundamentally speaking, I'm getting more and more friendly hogs, uh, partially because I, I think, you know, if we are headed into harder economic times, uh, that pork might be a really nice substitute for a lot of people looking to, to spend less money at the grocery store. Uh, so that, that might actually help pork demand. Um, but you know, again, we're going to have to see, we got to stay up here and, and turn around and get through these key resistance levels. If not, then we're just going to be kind of languishing down here. It might want to take some more time to put in a more defined bottom. V bottoms aren't really what you want to see. Although I will say it's more common in livestock than it is, say, in, in uh, deeper markets, more high volume markets like grains, for example. So do you think there was a little square in here up ahead of the Fed meeting too or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the big surprise that would be bullish commodities would be a, a, a surprise rate cut. We didn't see that. Um, but, you know, anytime there's a, a risk event like that, yeah, I do think there is just a little bit of bookkeeping that happens uh, for that. Um, when all said and done, though, the Fed did nothing. They they didn't change rate. They, they left rates unchanged, which was what was widely expected in the market. Uh, the question there, though, is after the the pretty massive strength that we've seen in the dollar over the course of the last two days, does that mean the dollar continues to get stronger or because they left rates unchanged, does the dollar now retrace some of that move? So uh, tomorrow I think is going to be a, a very interesting day for the dollar index. All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Ted Seifert, Zanarag Hedge. That is Markets Now.